fishing around boulders, you know, and, and assuming you're talking pocket water, you really can break it down into, you know, four pieces. You've got the sides, so one and two. You've got the front, and you've got the eddy in the back. Most people know about the eddy in the back, um, and that is a great place to 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 throw a fly and and get a drift and find a fish. Um, but depending on the structure of the rock, you could have holding water and overhang on the sides and a current break uh, and definitely worth throwing a fly and putting some drifts in there, but also the front of a rock. There's a hydroplane uh, that happens when water hits the front of the rock and it pushes back on itself. And trout love to sit on the top side of those boulders. Very overlooked until you see, you know, you can literally watch a trout surfing on you know, the front of a boulder and then it clicks. You're like, wow. And that's a very active leaf feeding fish. So um, I think a lot of folks overlook that. It's just kind of understanding, you know, not to a science degree, but just basics of hydrodynamics. And uh, that front lie in front of that boulder is probably the prime location for feeding trout. So definitely fish the front. Um, and, and really it's, you'll, you'll notice it too. If you're fishing, um, if you're fishing your flies properly, you're getting a good grip with no drag. You're going to see where that fly will actually kind of stall out in front of the rock. If you get directly in front of that rock, it's not going to push one side or the other. It's going to hang up and that's where that fish lies. So don't think you've got to go around a boulder and, and down through an eddy a lot of times. And, and usually the bigger or more aggressive fish will be in front of that boulder with it being the prime lie so make sure you hit that um getting a drag free drift is really important so you know in our water pocket water um one thing i really help a lot of folks with when they're first fish this area is to shorten their casts a lot of folks think you need to have longer casts and in our in our water you've got so many so much dynamic current that if you've got even five feet of line on the water you're going to get pulled 10 different directions. So these fish uh, holding in the water that they do aren't going to be that shy. Just walk in and get as close as you can and keep that line off the water and get a good drag free drift. That's the best thing you can do for fishing pocket water. Um, fly control. And that, the best way to do that is to have as much line off the water as possible. So that is, um, if you approach it like that, you know, fish it thoroughly. Um, look at every boulder the same way where it's got four sides and there could be a fish on, on all four with the front end being the, the top of the boulder, the front, the one facing the current being that prime lie, you know, break it down in that, in that, uh, in that scenario. And, uh, you know, give a good, give a good half dozen casts at least to each side and, and break it down, fish it thoroughly. Um, so fishing, fishing drops and with drops, you've got usually fast current coming in. Usually around here, it's pretty deep below that drop and you've got a big eddy. And that is, can be difficult water for a lot of folks to fish, uh, myself included. Coming from out west like I did, we don't have a lot of water like that. So it takes a little getting used to. Um, one thing you've got to learn right away, not all current goes directly downstream. You've got an eddy, so you sometimes have trout facing downstream. They're still facing in the current, but they're facing the wrong way. <laughs> so, you know, so uh, when you get in that eddy, just take your time, let that current kind of read that current and let your flies go, whether you're fishing an indicator rig, a dry dropper, your own nymphing, whatever you're doing, let that just work around. And so if you're doing it properly, it should really kind of follow and circle around and, and not just going a straight path downstream. Uh, one thing you'll notice is you'll hit different currents where they go kind of cut under each other, stall out. If you find yourself stalled out, don't be afraid to manipulate that fly, drag it into a more prominent current, let that current take it down and, and give it some movement. Uh, a lot of times those fish will be sitting in a current seam, not in the, that kind of dead frog water. They will move out and pounce on it if they see it, but you've got to keep that fly moving through there. Um, but yeah, you can, you know, hypothetically, you can sit and fish one drift, you know, for an infinite amount of time by just letting it work around through that eddy. 
Um, so just understand how that current works. Uh, I think the last question was uh, how to fish a dry fly through a ripple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a few things you can do there. First, um, make sure that you have the right dry fly. If you've got a dry fly that is designed for still water or flat water, and by that I mean if you've got something that, ha you know, uh, fairly light on the hackle, um, you know, if it's got a tail that's more of a uh, anatomically correct, the split little mayfly tail, um, something that's very thin, it's not going to hold on the surface in, in broken water like that. It's going to get pulled under much more easily. That's why you see guys uh, that fish, you know, something like a humpy or a stimulator or even some foam bugs, much more buoyant. They're going to stay on top longer in that broken up water. So having a fly that's uh, more buoyant and is going to float longer, even through broken water, uh, is is key. Choosing a good floatant is also very important. Not all floatants are created equal. I'm not going to tell you which ones are are not worth the money, so to speak. I don't want to speak ill of any one company because there is some personal preference. But I will tell you the ones that I like the best are the Dry Magic and the high and dry those gels and powders they're phenomenal um and that's just from experience here i've kind of tried them all and from our experience here in this broken choppy water that we often fish those are the two that seem to to work the best to work the longest um so a good quality floatant um prepping your dry fly before you even approach that that water by if it's if you've been fishing it's getting a little waterlogged dry it off you know, shake it out with some powder and get as buoyant as possible. The uh, other piece of information or uh, advice I'd give on that too is um, I've heard, I've heard it called different things, but a shake cast, a snake cast, you know, uh, when you, an S cast, I think I've heard it called too, but the idea is when you cast and, and we're talking long riffles, what's more uniform, not something that you need to high stick to get over multiple currents. It's more, of a uniform current for you know the, the the stretch of water you're fishing where you don't mind putting fly line on the um on the water make that little shake so when you cast before as the as the line straightens out on the forward cast just shake the rod tip make a little z pattern with it and you'll get these little snakes little uh, curves in your fly line and in a riffle like that those curves have to kind of work themselves out and uh, and straighten out before that current can really pull and bow your fly line and pull that fly out of drift. So if you were just to cast in a straight line, you know, smooth, straight, pretty cast, uh, that line, that current's going to pull on it right away. So if you can work a little bit of some angles and some curves into that fly line, that's got to get worked out before um, your your fly itself starts to drag, and that's going to give you a little bit longer uh you know on your drift before you have to say mend or or do something to keep it uh, dead drifted so yeah that's kind of that's kind of the tips i'd give uh folks that are having issues having trouble with um riffles that they're kind of challenging for them uh also don't be afraid to get in close like i said in in broken water those fish feel pretty concealed and a lot of people sell a lot of people sell that short and you're going to spook a few fish until you find that sweet spot and kind of know how far you can push it but don't be afraid to to push it and you know push in there so like work your edges work your way into that water but once you get in there um and even if you do move a couple of fish and they know you're there they'll settle down usually so you know work the water get in close and just kind of break it apart and uh work it in segments and uh and um, don't try to don't try to you know cast from too far away because you're just making it more challenging. That's all good information. That going back to the rock, let's go back up to the boulder. That front leading edge of the boulder, we I've been calling it the pillow because it's soft pillow, water. That's a good way. Yep, a good way to put it. If you're fishing the currents and the drop offs and that sort of thing, I think that was good advice to let somebody know to keep the if it stalls out keep it moving, pull it back into the current yeah. you know, right on that edge, on that seam. And I, I say try and, to fish the seams as often as possible to keep that fly moving yep. and keep that fly moving. Just kind of two things that we try. 
Yeah, don't don't be afraid to manipulate a fly. And, and you know, there's there's times when you may have to make a cast that isn't exactly where you want it to be, maybe past where you want to fish. And then as you drag it in, you're kind of lining those flies up to then drift down through the lie that you want to you want to fish so it doesn't always have to be right on the nose you can you can use that rod and use that current to your advantage and manipulate the flies in, in a way until you get the drift that you want i like that snake cast too that you were bringing in too that I mean to me that snake cast and, and a lot of people have probably had 10 different names for it and somebody's out there yeah you know uh thinking no that's not what it's called but that's what yeah. we're calling it today and that's what matters yep. uh is is that snake cast equals e extra drift is what it really equals extra presentation. And, and anybody that's listening to this podcast for any length of time knows that presentation to, to me and to, to every, probably everybody that's ever been on here is like the key every time, you know, it's about the right fly yeah. matters and all that other stuff, matter, the right line, the light, like tip it, all that stuff, even the right rod reel, all that stuff, right. Waiters matter, but the presentation is where the rubber meets the road. So uh, so that, that snake cast helps. Yeah, you can think of it as little, like little mends, you know. So we all know how to, like most of us know how to make a mend and and put a mend into the current or against it to um, get the fly to drift longer. But when you make that little snake cast, shaky cast, whatever you want to call it, you're just putting all these little mends into your line that need to be worked out. So it just, yeah, it just buys you time. Yeah, and it was it was cool that you said that it it whenever you you cast in and it's a straight line it's going to start dragging almost immediately but that little snake cast it gives you that extra it's a lot that's a lot like a bunch of little men's until it straightens out you still have a chance <laughs> kind right, of probably exactly. the best yeah. way to put it hey i mean you me. know if it if if it buys you a half a second and that's what it takes for that to go over that fish and get them you know convince them to, to hit and that's all you need yeah i think one of the things when i fished up there in, in the smokies but up there let's let's talk specifically about teleco not that it's much different than anywhere else that has high gradient streams is how close you really can get to the fish it stuns me how close you can get, you can get to them up there like you can't step on their head but you can get a lot right. closer than what you think and as you move your way up or down the river i usually fish up the river but you know as you move to the next place you keep that in mind of okay i got this close and they move so this time i'll just you know be a half a step back or a step back and you know or ease in a little slower you know something like mm -hmm. that and you just you dial yourself in as you move make move after move after move so you know i'm, I'm not one That's to right. park yep. i don't really park on one particular pool or one particular riffle or one particular drop off I fish it and keep moving. So that's, that's the way that I do it, but everybody doesn't fish. Like yeah. that, so. and, and, you know, I'm, I'm not saying there's not more than one way to do it, but myself and, and a lot of the anglers that are experienced with this kind of water, I mean, they move fast and sometimes surprisingly fast. And, uh, you know, even talking to and fishing with Walter Babb, you know, we talked about Walter um, mm -hmm. a little bit on the phone and, and even at 70, he moves pretty fast. Like he knows that if you're, you put some good drifts in there and of course, with experience, you know what a good drift is and what isn't. You learn to read the water. So every every cast he makes is, counts, you know. And uh, if he's not getting any 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 um, uh, action on that cast or any any uh, interest, he's moving on. And and that's just what you've got to you've got to move fast. And and at the same time, I mean, someone might look at me and and I fish with folks where we're fishing in a stretch and. You know, I work all the way through maybe 50 yards of water and I come back around and they're still like in the head of the same pool where I left them. And they ask how many, of, how, you know, how, have you done any good? And they're like, no, nah, I've caught two. It's like, how many you catch? I've caught 12. It's like, yeah. really? It's like, yeah, but I mean, I just, I, I hit it all, you know. <laughs> I've been a, I've been a mile up this stream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and Walter will tell you the same thing. You know, Walter says, uh, you know, when he tells somebody I caught 30, 40 fish and they, that sounds impressive, but then you realize, heck, I've walked two miles, you know, like, I, you know, I just covered a lot of water. Of course you caught fish. If there's only, if there's only five fish in that pool and you spent uh, two hours in that pool, you're the maximum you can get, catch is five fish. <laughs> so you and know, your, your but, odds are keep going down every cast. I feel, I feel like yeah. it does anyway, until you rest them or something like that. And then you have another yeah. chance, yeah. but. And I always say, you got to find the, you got to find the ones willing to play. You know, yeah. if they're not willing to play, don't waste your time. I mean, absolutely. But yeah, it, you know, and it, it might look to folk, the people that I, I'm just kind of 
you know, working too fast at times, but even though I'm working fast, I'm always trying to not even take a step forward without strategizing where I'm going to go, identifying even the smallest pocket, because you can have a pocket the size of a five gallon bucket that holds a 16 inch fish. Like it's just, you know, and people overlook that. And the thing is, if you can identify those areas and approach them correctly, those fish are so willing to eat. They're so willing to play. They'll eat just about anything if it's presented properly because they're not getting bothered. They're not getting getting pressured at all. I mean, they're living a pretty happy life until you come along. So, uh, <laughs> so you know, you just got to ruin their day. But, uh, but uh, you know, never move forward without without a strategy, you know, and it's kind of like hunting in that regard. And that's the reason I love these streams so much because mm -hmm. the, out West, you know, you can have a lot of fun. You can sit over one riffle all day. That's maybe got hundreds of fish in it and barely move your feet. You move up and down the bank and just fish the same run. And that's fun. But, uh, you know, when you know that these pockets, these fish are spread out, you've got basically one fish per pocket because these are fairly infertile streams. They can't tolerate each other's presence. There's just not enough food. So they've got this right. pecking order and they spread out uh, and you get one shot at one fish in a pocket. And if you miss him and he gets wise, you've got to move on. And uh, to me, that's that's more like hunting than it's fishing. And I'm not really a hunter and I don't have the patience to hunt. But uh, whenever I fish, it's kind of how I view it. And, you know, using kind of using your environment to your advantage, paying attention to where you cast your shadow, paying attention to which rocks conceal your feet. Yep. which rocks uh you can conceal your your body and your movement even using the roto to your advantage or whatever vegetation is hanging over um using even the current to your advantage you know and and if i approach him from this angle where there's a slick you know is he going to look up through that slick and see me or if i stay on this side where there's more white water you know and that breaks up my my profile um it does that offer me a better opportunity you know and also put, putting yourself in the spot where you've got the best cast, where you can lay out a cast um, and be able to basically make yourself ready to, to fish and set the hook at any moment from the start to the finish. Um, being able to mend or pick up line or even set the hook, you know, it was all really important. You got to use every every bit of your environment to your advantage. It makes a huge difference. And you need to go into it as saying, all right, I'm probably going to catch a fish out of here. So I need to be ready for all those oh, yeah. things, for setting up my cast, making the cast, making the presentation, setting the hook, missing if that happens, what's going to happen if right. I miss. Uh, Is it not putting in a tree? Yeah, am I going to be climbing a tree? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yep. How many branches are on it? See if it'll hold my weight or not. <laughs> That's right. Yep. <laughs> Oh, but, all uh, good. No, that was all good right there, Cody. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's a fun game, you know, and, and, um, uh, oh, you, you know, back what you were saying about, um, about, you know, running through your head, you have to run that scenario through your head, you know, look at a piece of, of, of water. Let's say you've got to run, you know, back to, um, back to the riffle and, and boulders and all that. Let's say you've got, it comes off of a drop and there's a nice shoot. There's you got, you got kind of more riffle areas on both sides. You've got a nice flat rock in the back that's pushing current, making that pillow or that hydro. And you can look at it and before you even step foot in there. And so many people look at the top of that run and want to go right to the top of that run. <laughs> and if you watch your feet, you're going to watch a fish, you know, yeah, dart out from, you sure from will. That, that back side. And, uh, yeah. and so you have to, before you even step foot in that run, you have to be, you have to be, you know, preparing for where you're going to be making your cast and you know you almost run through like if you look you imagine the piece of wa water you look at it in front of you and you could almost put percentages on on each lie potential lie and say oh that is a great looking piece of water up there at the top at the head of the pool but I still have a pretty good chance of there being a fish here in the tail and if I just try to if I you know if I'm just drooling over that that nice piece of water at the, at the top and I step through, I'm going to miss the, I'm going to miss the fish. So, um, so you even, even if you have a small percent chance of they're saying, they say there's a, if there's a log over the side and it's shallow, but it's a little undercut and there may be a fish, you know, concealed under that log or whatever it might be a little bit of shadow cast by some overhanging brush. Even if it's a slightly smaller percentage um, than that water that you really want to fish, make some cast in there and make them count and you may be really surprised. Um, so don't pass up anything that could potentially hold a fish. And, and you'll learn as you, uh, 
as you know, just learn every, every cast you make and every fish you make, you should be learning something new and just evaluating what went right or what went wrong or why did I miss that fish? What could I have done better the next time? And eventually you're going to piece it all together. You know, and I, I've had times where I've had a stubborn fish in a, in a place that I may, you know, you, it may not be obvious that he's lying there and I'll make a cast and cast and cast. And I'll say, I know you're in there. Like you are, you're <laughs> in there. I know you are. Where are you at? And you'll, you know, maybe you'll make that fifth cast and you'll do something a little bit different where you hold that rod a little higher, get a little more dead drift, or maybe let it swing out at the back and, and that nymph rises and uh <laughs> and you got him and it, to me there's no better reward i don't care if he's a five inch that you matters. know rainbow like yeah. i still laugh my head off whenever I, that happens because it's so rewarding to solve that puzzle you know and you know he's there and it's like how many people have passed over that fish and and never never even knew that was a the yeah. spot where a fish would, would sit so before, before we do this intro i want to go back to that back of the pool scenario where you're standing in the back of the pool but you see that really good lie up there at the head of the pool. What if you just say, I'm going to walk up as close as I can to the, to that really good lie. And the first step you take, it blows that fish out of the back of the pool. And he runs up to the head of the pool and he puts that fish down that you really yeah. had your eyeball on. And that is absolutely the biggest bummer ever. Yeah. Something I've noticed with our particular water and I've noticed this at low water and talking to customers, uh, you know, we'll talk about North River, of course, but North River is a lot slower gradient than many streams in this area. Yeah, so it's very it unique in that regard. And you have to approach it a little bit differently. And we've had some some dry years. And during one of those dry years, that water is so glassy calm. And there's fish that are just, they're not sitting, they're sitting in inches of water. They're sitting like under under any bit of cover they can find. Right. And I've, I've walked into a tail out and almost crawled on my belly just to look up and see where these fish are lying. And what you'll notice is as soon as they see you, and I've had, heard people say, man, we walked through water. I mean, it's, it was only ankle deep or whatever. And, but we walked through some great looking water. We never even saw a fish. And like, of course you didn't because they're, they're not silly enough to, uh, when they see a pet predator panic and just run that pool back and forth. What they do is if you were to sneak up on one and you spot them, uh, and before he spots you, you're going to see him just slide under a rock, yep. you know, or slide under a piece of cover. And it doesn't matter short of kicking your foot under that rock and flipping it over. He's not coming out of there. That's exactly so right. So most folks, they're not familiar with this kind of water or that scenario. They're going to walk right on top of them and they're going to stand up, you know, and kind of meerkat around and look into that pool and, <laughs> and not see anything. And they're going to say, man, there's not even any fish in here. And, and the thing is, meanwhile, if you could, if you could get a, you know, fish eye view of well, what's going on underwater, you've probably got four or five, six fish in there just tucked under waiting for that guy to move on, you know? So, right. uh, so yeah, there's times when back to what you were saying, I mean, they don't always just go right to the head and, and alert the entire yeah. pool that can't happen. Um, but if you do spook a fish or if you hook and lose a fish, or if you miss one, that you know don't wash your hands of the whole run and say that it's over um and and man if you could if you can look at the bottom you know i've taken underwater video and all that and that bottom that bottom is so dynamic that you could spook a fish on one side of the rock and the other f side of that fish would be oblivious like it's just they can't even see each other you know so it really kind of depends on the water type yeah now if they're in a, if they're in a gravel riffle because those exist on north and some places up here too and it's all kind of flat, relatively flat, and they're kind of spread out through that riffle. If you spook one, he goes flying past those other fish. They're probably done too. So it just depends on the type of water. But that's exactly the scenario I'm, I'm, I'm talking about right there is whenever you step and they just they blow out and then you don't stand a chance on anything else up there at the head of the pool where you thought, you know, that's where I was headed to. And all of a sudden, well, there's no reason to even go up there now because junior just ran up there and scared everybody you know you still fish right. it don't get me wrong but your your percentage your chance of catching you know that percentage goes way way down pretty low yeah, yeah. and even if they don't even if they're still there feeding i mean they'll they'll put themselves on high alert oh yeah you know, so yeah so it, if you can present a fly to them in that case they might still eat it but chances are if you you put even a slight shadow over them or anything you know out of the ordinary they're gone so well, let's go ahead and kick this thing off from high atop the world headquarters of Southeastern Fly, this is the Southeastern Fly podcast. 
Thanks for joining us for this episode. Feel free to share the episode with your friends and fishing partners. Subscribe or follow so you'll be the first to know when an episode drops. If you find value in the podcast, and we hope you do, please drop by the Southeastern Fly Store and explore the merch that fuels this podcast. So who is our guest today? As you can tell, he's dedicated to fly fishing and especially around the Teleco area. He was born in Illinois and has always been an angler. He moved out west and took up fly fishing. He first fly fished in the Black Hills, started guiding, fished for trout all over the country, loves to fish for native brookies, has a wife named Abby. He opened Teleco Outfitters in Teleco Plains, Tennessee in 2019. Please welcome to the podcast, Cody Fisher. Cody, that intro was, it may have been one of the longest one, but it also may have been one of the ones with the most information that somebody could pick up and go to go to Teleco and get busy up there. That was there's a lot. That was good discussion one, but the main thing is it was good, useful information for our listeners. So thanks for uh, agreeing to uh, to meet with me on a on a late Wednesday evening uh, when the wind is out there blowing. I swear right now it's probably up to thirty miles now. I don't know if you can hear it here, but it is. Oh yeah, crushing some trees out there. Uh, yeah, I got my chainsaw on the back in case I can't get home tonight. That's a so. good idea. If it's anything <laughs> over there like it is over here, you're going to probably need it because a friend of mine had a tree blow down in his in from his yard into his neighbor's yard about uh, probably about two hours ago. So oh, it's wow. it's really doing some. I'm it's really coming up live here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, then some rain's going to move in a little bit later this evening, and and uh, that'll be making it interesting on the river tomorrow. But uh, so we're talking about Teleco, uh, Teleco River in that area, which includes, for me, it includes the Bald River and the North River and a little bit of Sitico. So let me tell you about my first time up there, just so you know where I'm coming from. And I used to, when we lived in Knoxville, it was 45 minutes from my front door to the river and probably about another 10 or 15 up to the places that I really liked, the pools and the riffles and runs and all that stuff that I really liked to fish, the stretch of river that I really enjoyed. So it's probably about a 50, 55 minute drive up to what I consider, quote, unquote, my place. I used to love to fish it before they opened it up uh, for the season, so to speak, before they start, started stocking. We'll get into that in a minute. I want to ask that a question about that. But uh, we used to go up there that week before because we figured, all right, probably most of the fish have had time to kind of hold over, get get acclimated and all that. And it was really kind of a challenge. To, uh, it was the biggest challenge that te Teleco permit, uh, provided for us to catch a fish. So the challenge, I guess, may be what I kind of looked for at that time, which sounds crazy, but, sure. you know, I, I never I never said I was sane. <laughs> but the first time that we went, uh, my neighbor, Pat, who I've told many times about Pat on this podcast, and we would fish about three times a week, uh, unless we could get in four or five times a week, and then we'd fish that. But Sunday afternoons were kind of our time to after church, we'd get in the, get in his truck. He had a black two door four runner. Uh, and I don't remember what year it was, but it was, it was old enough that the paint was kind of thinning out where the sun had, had uh, deteriorated it, uh, delaminated a little bit. So it was like almost a little rusty across the hood and across the tops of the fenders. Uh, and on the back, it was, it was a forerunner, but it kind of looked like a truck with a camper top on the top of it. I don't know if that, if that rings a bell, but if you got Google, yeah. uh, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It was four wheel drive and we throw fly rods in there. And I say we went fishing three or four times a week, but it seemed like on Saturday we were just, or Sunday afternoon, we were just out exploring. So Sunday sure. afternoon was more of an exploratory time. And we left Carnes or Knoxville. Uh, we lived in Carnes, which is might as well be Knoxville. And now it really kind of is Knoxville, but we left Carnes. I don't know. After, well, it's probably about one o'clock. Uh, and it, I, I want to say it was February because it was cold uh, it, when we left the house and we drove towards Sitico. He said, I want to go to Sitico, which I never, never even heard of Sitico or Teleco, neither one. I said, oh, OK, well, that sounds good. So what we did is we get in this truck and we start driving. And as we were driving, we passed by a fort. We passed by a Indian museum, I think, a Native American museum. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we went into Sitico somehow and we started up Sitico and he was telling me a story about, he said, I took a, took a month off or I took a semester off from school and went and lived in the woods, which you and I were talking about Jeremiah Johnson. 
That's kind of oh, what yeah. it was like. So nice. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we went to Sitico. We scouted out some water. I don't remember if we fished or not, but he said, we're going to go over to Teleco. Well, the further up the mountain we got, the more the snow started covering the trees and the ground and then the road. Oh, yeah. And then it it really covered the road and then a little bit of ice here and there and the on the <laughs> like the inside bends away from the sun it would be like a patch of ice mm -hmm. uh, so we'd slow down a little bit and you know we were in four-wheel drive and we get up to some little two-lane logging road and he said i think i, I i'm going to quote him here i think this is the road the the logging road that goes over to teleco that's dangerous words around here yeah yeah right exactly i didn't know how <laughs> dangerous they were until later so we we finally got up and over the hill and we came to the lake and you'll have to help me with the name of that lake up there. Um, I'm an Indian, Indian boundary. Yeah, Indian boundary. Mm -hmm. And it was way down because it was winter. So there was a lot of mud banks there. But on the mud banks were all these trees that had blown over and some had been thrown in there, it looked like. And all I was thinking was this would be the perfect place for crappie in about, you know, four months. It just looked like a crappie wonderland up there. But uh so we stopped there, looked at that, starting to get dust now. We go on down the mountain somehow, don't remember the road, but we ended up probably about halfway down the river. Uh, and we didn't turn right and go into Teleco Plains. We went left. He said there's a little, he called it like a little camp uh, up here. And so we take off up the, up, up the river road. <laughs> And it's all ice. Like there's not this clear spot and then it goes to icy. Yeah. It was like mostly mm -hmm. all ice. There might've been a clear spot here and there. And, and it was gravel at the time. I don't know if it still is, but it was all gravel. Paved, paved now. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was the last time we were up there, it was mm -hmm. paved up there a long ways, but, uh, but it was all gravel, I think. And, and we get up to green cove and you couldn't get a cell signal at all up there not yeah. not no my phone wouldn't do it and I, I don't remember what company i had he had a different company and he always had cell signal when i didn't but even his <clears> phone <throat> wouldn't get it then and we get up to the green cove and and there were probably 20 30 campers up there all winterized you could tell nobody was there and we stopped at the motel nobody was there and it was late on a sunday evening by this time it was dark so I said, Hey, I need to call my wife. So we called our wives from that, that pay phone. Little pay phone. Yep. Yeah. Which I don't know if it's still there, but that is still there. there. Is it really? It's still, your, it's still your only lifeline. There's no, still no cell. Still no cell signal. Okay. Yep. So uh, we did that Called them. We said, we're on our way home. We really weren't on our way home. We went all the way up into North Carolina for a ways until we just couldn't go any further because the, we, we didn't feel comfortable uh, any longer because of uh because of the, the snow and all that turn around came back down, came through Teleco Plains. Uh, and that was really my first view of Teleco Plains. Uh, so it, it was a cold Sunday afternoon that turned into a colder Sunday evening that turned into ice and snow yep. and such a great adventure. Uh, it really made me love Teleco. I went back the next day, took a friend up there uh, and, and we didn't fish. We just rode around. Uh, that's a whole other story. But, I mean, we saw yeah. Sitico, we saw the lake, we saw uh, uh, Indian Boundary Lake, we saw pretty much the whole river up to the very top. We stopped and looked at the looked at the uh, the hatchery up there. Of course, you couldn't go mm -hmm. in it because it was closed, but you sure. know, we pretty much saw the whole thing. But it was at a time uh, where you could go up and just, I mean, you take a tent, pull over to the side of the road on a little pull-off, set your tent up. Yeah, You stay there three or four days. We'd stay there for three or four days and fish and and you know sit by the fire i mean i've had days where i just went and we fish a couple of days and we'd stop and go back and just sit by the fire for more than you know half a day and just sit there and enjoy it yeah well you just described teleco at its best and at its worst at the same time which makes <laughs> sense if you know this area it's there's always a little sense of a danger or unknown you know going up oh, there because yeah. you, you don't have service you don't always know if you're not familiar with the area, you know, who knows if that road's going to go through or top out. There's only so many roads that go through, right. uh, you know, you've got fallen trees, you've got ice, you've got, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of unknowns up there. So even mm -hmm. though, you know, I, I've, I've been, I've been places that boast a lot more 
wilderness and a lot more acres of national forest. But this area, especially for this part of the country, is still so remote and so wild in so many ways. And you yes. got to love that. Like, you got to love that about it because, you know, that's getting more and more rare all the time. So ha- ha- having, having to be having to use your wits, having to be a little self-reliant having to improvise, you know, to get yourself out of the situation. Like that's kind of what Teleco is still about in a lot of ways. So uh, it's love a, it. It, it is a, a fine, fine place. Um, and I know that it probably has its issues. And I'm, I mean, that was 20, sure. 20 ish years ago, probably 22 or three years ago. So it's probably, other, I'm probably romanticizing what, what no, it's all I mean, about, other, other than uh, that road being paved all the way to the North Carolina line, you basically described it to a T. So I not much else has changed all the, huh. all the way to, yep. All the way to the North Carolina line and a little bit past. Oh, wow. But, but other than that main road being paved, you know, Indian boundaries, Sitico, that gravel road going up from Sitico to, to the lake uh, and then across to Teleco, like none of that, that all is the same, you know, that's all the same. So, you know, you can still pretty much camp wherever you want. It's all national forest as long as you're away from the road. Uh, they won't let you camp next to the road. You know, they don't want anybody camping on the, on the teleco and, you know, holding the fishing spot all week or anything like that. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, I don't know if that's changed, but no, it's still, it's still a, you know, a wild place and in some of the best ways and a few of the worst ways too. So, yeah. you know, well, it's a, you gotta love it. It's probably one of the prettiest rivers in Tennessee. I have to say that. I mean, as far as free yeah. stones go. Um, so, one of the things that I think that hopefully you can help clear up for us out for the listener out there and for me too, uh, because like I said, whenever that was another reason why we used to go before the stocking season started, because we could get away without having to pay the $2 permit or whatever it was, which, you know, sometimes $2 permits, a lot of money, but can you well, help us change now? It's yeah, that's six, six and a half now. Is so. it? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. I probably yeah. still try it, but can you help us understand where and when the permits are needed? Yeah, so the permit is, and that's probably the number one source of confusion for this area, but that permit is only needed March 1st through August 15th. Uh, now, that that time has changed, I guess, four or five years ago. I think they that used to extend into September, but they've since changed that to August. So from March 1st through August 15th, you need that permit. Uh, it's $6.50 per day. Um, the only really way to get around that is if you have a sportsman's license. Unfortunately, if you're out of state, uh, there's no, there's no other option than to get the daily for the number of days you're up here fishing. So, um, just keep that in mind. Um, uh, once August 15th rolls around, you no longer need the permit and you actually don't need it again until next March. Now, other things to note from March 1st through August 15th, the river is closed on Thursdays and Fridays for stocking, right. um, within the stocking area, there's still places you can fish below. That doesn't include North River or Bald River or any of the wild trout stream, streams that don't um, that don't uh, don't get stocked. But Sitico and Teleco both fall into that category, and so both require the permit. Both are closed Thursdays and Fridays, March first through August fifteenth. Um, now, the reason they do that is you've got uh, stocking trucks going up and down the road on those days. Uh, I don't remember how many on Citico, but Teleco gets three to 5,000 fish per week. And so that's a lot of fish to put in the river. You know, uh, having those days closed allows the uh, hatchery employees to do their job, to not have a lot of folks trying to, you know, follow them up. And, and right. because they would, you know, there's oh, a yeah. certain number of people that would just, if, you, if if they could follow that truck and just have them put them in a bucket for them, they would. So um, So that gives, you know, a little more of a sporting chance for those fish to spread out and get get settled in before the weekend and that that permit that daily permit even though it is an added expense that does uh, that does support the hatchery and you know that's a big operation for from march through august to to put three to five thousand fish and that's just in the that's just in the teleco that's not mentioning citico i think it's probably close to similar numbers for citico so how many miles of, of river how many miles of river is teleco so three to five thousand fish every thursday you said mm-hmm. Or Friday, I yep. guess. Every yeah, Thursday and Fridays. Yep, is when okay, they stock. So, I mean, not not three thousand Thursday and Friday, but yeah. they they stock between those two days. And then, how many um, river miles on the in the stocking area do you think? So, as far as what's being stocked, and that will change as uh, as 
the you know summer warms up and if it gets too warm they won't stock below a certain point um but at full stocking as we are right now with cooler temps probably about 15 miles 15 16 miles of water now that may that may be cut in half by the time you get to you know july or yeah, the start right. of august um once that water temp hits 68 degrees anywhere they're not stocking below that point they're going to go up until they find cooler temps because last thing you want to do is throw 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 trout into hot water where they're just going to suffocate and die or you know yeah. and get stressed so so you do that, that concentrates some of the anglers too but it does yep but there's plenty of water up there in my opinion to to be yep. okay especially if you're if you're a weekday fisherman we've got a lot of folks that fish during the week that listen to the podcast and you know if you went on a monday tuesday wednesday you there's plenty of water up there. I mean, you, you can yeah. practically have it to yourself. Um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you're going to see a few people, but it's nothing like the weekends. And it's, it's a whole different, it's a whole different um, vibe up there, you know, on the weekends. Um, I'm yeah. not going to dismiss or downplay anybody's enjoyment of the river, but there's a lot more people up there looking for a limit Yeah, and they're going to crowd every, every good pool, every good hole until they get that limit. So you know, if that's not your idea of fun, um, avoid the weekends. Having said that, and we run plenty of trips during the week, or sorry, during the weekends. Um, you know, I fish during the weekend, and and you know, as a fly fisherman, uh, usually we're hitting different types of water than what they're, what those folks are hitting. So, you know, avoid avoid the big, obvious, easy access pools. And to be honest, you're going to find more fish in the pockets through the spring and summer in the pocket water and that fast water that they're not fishing and they're not taking the effort to fish. I mean, most of them don't even, don't even wade, you know, they'll stand on the bank. And so they're pretty limited. Um, but yeah, you, you won't see another person in that fast pocket water. And as long as you don't mind putting the effort to wade, um, you'll, you'll catch plenty of fish. So there's still plenty of opportunity even on a busy weekend. So when you're fishing for trout, how far down is it worth fishing? And let's just take uh Let's break that up since they do, you know, since it does change temperatures as the summer goes on. Let's talk about uh, until about June and then after June, about how far down is it worth fishing for trout? Let's say let's say late May um, in a normal year and, you know, um, barring any any heat wave, you can find trout until until pretty late in May. I mean, all the way down to town. I mean, you oh, could okay. theoretically walk down, you know, just from the shop to the river and catch a few trout, but uh, that's going to change as that water warms up. So you can fish through town. I see. I didn't know that. You can. Yep. I've so, never fished down that low ever. Yeah. The water is the, uh, the whole river is public access. Um, of course, you've got to find a public uh, access point. Um, but once you're on the river, it's all, it's all public. Um, so you kind of have to know where to go on the lower part, but really, you know, the nice thing about Tennessee and especially this part, this area is that once you're about two, three miles outside of town, you get that Cherokee national forest sign. It's all public all the way to North Carolina line right. with the exception of like the green cove area where there's a few private cabins, but it's very obvious. You're not gonna, you're not going to be trespassing on a place that isn't clearly marked and clearly someone's property. So lots of easy access, um, you know, your, your total, total fishable miles from the time you drive uh, through town and up the river to the time you get to the North Carolina line is something like 20 miles. And uh, yeah, that pretty much all of that's going to hold trout until, until mid to late May. But once that water starts creeping past 70 or so, you know, and, and I would advise if you're going to catch and release the, the fish when it's that warm, but this is just for knowledge sake those trout are fine around 70, you know, if it gets above 70 here, yeah. um, they start to really, really suffer. Um, but I would, I would highly advise people to, if they take a, take a thermometer with them. I mean, I, I stock up on thermometers at the shop and I really push for people that want to catch and release to take one with them. And if that water reads higher than 68, keep moving up, you know, it's very, it's very elevation dependent. And while it might be, you know, it can it can get up to the end of the 70s, pretty much up to Bald River and a little past under a normal year, let alone a, a hot year. But once you get up to about Green Cove to the hatchery to that 2000 foot elevation, roughly, you're going to have cool water even during a, a 
heat wave. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you don't want to be careful with those fish and play them quickly and handle them as little as possible. But that is what we consider kind of the year round trout water. So from you could kind of look at it from North River confluence. So North River is a, a wild trout tributary from the point where that comes in about three, four miles above Bald River. The water's cool enough that you're going to find more and more wild trout until you get to the state line. So for me, I guess you, I'm kind of a snob in this regard, but like if a, if a water, uh, and I'm, I'm going to kind of diss my own home water, even <laughs> if water cannot support, uh, either holdover trout or even, you know, depending on my mood, I might even say, uh, wild trout and, and natural reproduction. If it can't support that, it's not truly a trout stream in my opinion. Um, and, and saying that it's like, that's not to say you can't have some excellent fishing and some of my favorite places to fish on Teleco are, are outside of that wild trout zone, mm-hmm. but your rural trout water is probably about 12 miles or so, um, the upper 12, upper 15. And so that's what supports trout year round where there is natural reproduction and that water is cool enough that you're going to find trout year round. So um, just know that if you come in the heat of summer and I see this a lot with folks that aren't familiar with the river, they're going to fish away too low where that water might be in the mid seventies and it might've been there for weeks. So there's, unless you're going to go for, for bass, which there are some good smallmouth in the lower river, um, unless that's your target, you're going to want to move up until you find those cooler temps. I have fished it when it was warm and had to keep going up and up and up and up. Yeah. And it just, it really wasn't a pleasant experience as far as the fishing goes because we had to keep moving so far up and everybody was kind of like crammed and, yep. and it was, it, we had planned to go. It's one of those trips where you leave Murfreesboro, you've planned it for a month or two and you're going to go, you've already got a place right. picked out to stay and all that stuff. And you just go and, you know, we didn't catch a bunch of fish. We had a great time, but we mm-hmm. just didn't catch a bunch of fish like we really wanted to, but you know, that's just the way it goes. Sometimes you plan those things and you go and it just, you take what you get. And that's just one of the kind of unfortunate part. It's kind of a miracle that there's even trout this far south, you know? Yeah. And if it wasn't for the elevation, they would, there wouldn't be. The groundwater at, you know, at the elevation here in town at 900 feet is like 68 degrees. So there's really, um, it's a miracle and it's all based on that elevation and canopy cover and everything. So if it wasn't for that, there wouldn't even be trout here to begin with. So so one, just the fact that they're this far south and and it supports wild trout and, and native brook trout is to me amazing. I, it's hard to wrap my head around sometimes, but uh, I love that that's that I love that it is uh, it is that way. But with that, you just have to understand that this far south, you're going to get hot water and and temperature is going to be a big factor, not only in whether or not you're going to have a successful day, but whether or not you should even fish it. Right. So, you know, I always stress that to folks, especially those that want to catch and release and, and don't want to harm that resource is, you know, if it gets too hot and we'll be the first to say it on our fishing reports and the first to tell people that, Hey, you know, fish somewhere else, maybe look for warm water options, which there are some around here, you know? So yeah, just be mindful of that. Uh, I would say if any, if there's any downtime, uh, around here, like an off season would be, um, uh, july and or uh, sorry august and september yeah so they're not stocking at that time now of course you don't need that permit which is a plus but there's not there's not going to be just a just a abundance of eager hungry fish that are going to eat anything you throw at them like you have during stock season um the water temps are a factor usually water levels are a bit of a factor then another bright side is there's not as many people here um, but you have to approach it entirely differently. You have to look for those, um, those cooler temps. And I'll, I'll talk briefly to another season that I haven't even mentioned that, you know, I would be uh, remiss if I didn't is our delayed harvest season. So, yeah. Yeah. What about that? So Oct- that's, that starts October. So you've got, you've got from March 1st, to August 15th, you've got your, um, your catch and keep your stock season, your permit season. And then from, you got that little downtime, mid-August, September, but once October rolls around, you've got catch and release only, artificial only, from the North Carolina state line downstream to North River, which is about 12 miles of water, 12, 13 roughly. And that is when a lot of the local fly fishing community and even a lot of people from the outside that uh, that want to uh, get the best shot of the year at a, at a large fish are going to make that trip in the fall. 
Um, and it's some of the best fishing all year. It is so much fun. You've got the full colors, you've got crystal clear water. You know, it's, it's almost once you, once that vegetation dies off and that water starts getting cold, oh, it's like yeah. glacier water. I mean, oh, it's, yeah. it's, just, it's fish just floating in air. It's the coolest thing. You see a, a 20 to 24 inch rainbow just floating there like a blimp, you know, it's so cool. Um, and, uh, so, you know, there's, there's not the crowds, there's a lot more fly anglers and uh it can get some it can still get crowded on weekends but uh no permit is needed at that time you know it is catch and release it is artificial only um you can fish any day of the week and they are stocking it but not as strict of a schedule weekly schedule as they are in the uh in the spring and summer it's more or less once maybe twice a month kind of as needed and the hatchery actually relies on us anglers to let them know how the fishing is so um, if it starts to, yeah, the hatchery up here is amazing. Uh, John, the hatchery manager, his whole crew are, are fantastic to work with. They've, it's been, you know, unbelievably supportive. They've been very supportive, uh, willing to help us and ask us what we think the teleco needs and listen. And, and you couldn't ask for a better working relationship with those guys and, and girls. So, you know, very, very cool. Um, that's good to hear right dynamic. there. Yeah. Local TU too is amazing here. So we've got a great community. But yeah, I mean, back to the fishing on, on, or during delayed harvest, I guess one of your best chances at a fish over 20 inches, uh, brown or rainbow. Sometimes you'll stock those big albino rainbows, you know, love them or hate them. It's kind of cool to see this, this big yellow banana, you know, calm <laughs> river nanners around here. And it's just cool to see one, you know, you can see them from the road. It's, it's, it is neat. So, um, a lot of people come up here looking for one of those. But yeah, it's a, it's a great time of year. And, um, you know, brookies, there's a lot of native brook trout up here getting off the teleco subject for a little bit. Uh, and that's a great time of year to find them. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the ball river and the North river and, and let's bring in the brookies into that too. So how does somebody find accurate information? I know they can go to the shop and all that, but everybody likes to kind of do their homework. Uh, so if we can just kind of get a lay of the land on the brook trout there and talk maybe a little bit about North River, a little bit about the bald, uh, and kind of if you can if you can bring all that together in, in like a sure a good little nucleus of information. Yeah. So I mean, first first and foremost, if you want to do your own leg work, you know, take take a map uh, of the area, look at the blue lines, and basically every, with a couple exceptions, every um, headwater to North or bald. Are, is going to have brook trout in it. Um, now, I would say elevation is very important. Elevation is key around here for a lot of reasons, but you got to find 2,000 to 2,500 feet. It's kind of the spot to start looking, and higher is even better. And for a number of reasons, um, cooler water for one, usually at that point, there's a barrier of some kind keeping browns and rainbows out, which do compete with brook trout. And what they're finding in this area is when the streams are healthy, that's not as big an issue as they used to believe it is, which is fantastic news. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so there are some streams in here where brook trout and rainbows will just kind of, you'll catch one and then the other, both healthy, you know, all different year classes. So they're doing well. Um, and it really, you know, once the environment is intact and healing like it is from the logging days, like they've got a fighting chance of, you know, this is their homeland and their home turf. So they can, they can hold their own. So um but yeah find those blue lines find those higher elevations and um well i mean to be quite honest come ask us we'll we'll tell you you know if we deem you worthy if you show up <laughs> on the screen you're in your pocket and you know, <laughs> a cooler uh, a creel on your on your shoulder we're probably gonna lead you astray but you know if you seem like you're cool and you're gonna uh protect those native brookies you know and and uh enjoy them and let them go um <laughs> about much worse for wear than you know we will bring you into the into the fold into the inner circle <laughs> into the teleco but, um, outfitters inner circle yeah. of, <laughs> yeah. of not, that we're, <laughs> not that we're snooty or anything but we are protective because uh you know this is one of the best strongholds in the entire state um for southern strain appalachian brookies yeah um we, we've had actually there's about a dozen total and maybe about half of those are are worth exploring for brookies which means they're gonna have better fishing opportunities um but we've actually added three more to that list uh -huh. and you know i'll let people i'll let people either try, either try to figure it out or they can they can 
talk to me, but it's fairly recent. So we're trying to let those populations establish, but uh, they've pulled um, uh, some brood stock from upper Bald River area. Oh, one of those okay. tributaries up there. Yeah. Beautiful, healthy. I mean, we're talking 10, 11 inch fish, just oh. mature, just beautiful rookies. Yeah. Surprisingly nice, nice fish. I uh, took them to the Chattanooga Aquarium. Um, they're using them for brood stock currently. They got about a thousand fry the first year. They've got about 3,000 fry out of them this year. Oh. And uh, they they tested them. You know, they do genetic testing on them, see how pure right. the strain of southern brook trout. And unfortunately, what they find just from years of um, low populations and then putting northern strain on top of those when they started restocking and not understanding the difference in genetics, what they find is a lot of what we consider Southern Appalachian strain brookies around here actually have some Northern yeah. genetics. And uh, uh, what they found with this particular population is it's one of, if not the purest Southern strain that they've ever tested it. Have you so, ever been to their research center, not at the aquarium, but on the river down by Baylor school? Uh, I have not. I mean, I've seen, I've seen pictures of, and I know of it, but I've never been to it. You should really go down there and tour that thing. Yeah. You would, you yeah. would come back with a, with a, well, with a visual, you know, that you could explain, but it yeah. is, man, it's interesting down there. They've got sturgeon and brook trout, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Hurdles. They no, got all really kinds cool. of things in there. Yeah. You should really take time out. Uh, and I can get you the name of the guy that, that runs it. Oh, if sure, you ever want to go down there. I mean, it's like, you yeah, know, absolutely. It's about yeah. an hour and a half from you. So, yeah, let yeah. Me see. I'm, I, yeah, I've got a, I've got a background in fisheries. So that stuff, oh, I'm okay. still I still oh, yeah. kind of nerd out about that stuff. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was going to say. You can go all nerd on that then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. But yeah. So we're, we're very blessed to have that. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's a, a draw for people that, you know, as long as they respect that resource, because, you know, uh, these Southern brookies have lost 90% of their habitat, you know, they're not that they're and, and they're, they're slowly regaining it through efforts like this, where they're being restocked in some of their native streams, but they are definitely worth if you enjoy that that kind of thing where you know you're not going to catch a lot of fish five six inches seven inches i mean i know i mentioned some 10 11 inch fish but that's really rare you still um but if you if you just appreciate them for what they are and being these native fish that have just survived the whole logging history and everything here that you know it's definitely worth the pursuit if you've ever seen the history of the logging up there in that area my goodness you've been yeah. amazed uh, at, at how they could have ever survived that because it was like running logs down rivers and cutting everything that's that's yeah that's the amazing the amazing thing yeah i mean they're like these populations i mean you just think about it where they must have just been a handful of individuals and some little trickles that just happened to not get you know locked out or or just for, somehow they survived and it's really incredible because if you uh, understand and read about the the level of devastation that this area was left in where there was just mount, whole mountains on fire because of nothing but down trees and brush yeah. and landslides and and the, you know everywhere you walk up here once you know what to look for i mean you you think you're out in the middle of nowhere but you look around there's a logging road somewhere <laughs> it's all been so it's amazing that they're they even survived you know well, let's move on. We got the last question coming up here. I've kind of been, as we've been sure. talking, I've been throwing these questions out and it's all been, it's been really good information, Cody. I think uh, somebody that's listened to it this long uh, has probably got a whole lot of information that's usable uh, that they could probably go up there and, and have some familiarity with, with uh, the Teleco area. Uh, and, and obviously stop by Teleco Outfitters uh, uh, and, and, you know, stock up with whatever you need to, but I can tell right now that, uh, that you're willing to give out useful information, which is what we always look for here. That's the one thing that I always, and I told you that in the very beginning of, Hey, we just, we're looking for useful information. We don't want, we want your secrets, of course, but we don't have to have everything <laughs> that you've got, but. Well, that's, that's part of the fun. Yeah. And, and we don't, uh, there's, there's some secrets, but as far as the teleco goes and, and your more popular streams, North and ball, there's really not a lot of secrets, you know, I have, you know, there's no problem in, in directing to where to go and, and telling you what to use and, you know, whether people even choose to to go to that effort to catch fish, that's kind of up to them. And, and fortunately, I think a lot of people don't, you know, so yeah, that yeah. keeps it, that keeps it, uh you know, pristine in a way and, and fishing well. But um yeah, it's, it's a great area for all, all skill levels for sure between the stocked river, 
and the wild trout streams and all that. So yeah, it's it's diverse in that area for sure. So what's what's the one thing that we haven't asked or haven't talked about uh, for the Teleco area that we should have asked you? We kind of touched on on approaching water and all that, but uh, yeah, don't don't be afraid to explore. There is so much water up here. There's something like 350 miles of trout water up here that uh, that I've I haven't even fished at all yet. I've been making a point too, and just can't. It, there's so much that you have to pass to even get to these more remote stretches that usually end up fishing somewhere else before you get there. Sure. Um, but <laughs> yeah. you know, come come prepared for everything because you can be you can be nymphing uh, or throwing streamers and throwing uh, you know big bright kind of goofy flies for these stocked fish and and have a blast doing that or you can go up and and you know bring a little three weight little two weight throw some little dries and little droppers for uh north river bald river and have the whole place to yourself you know just just be very versatile in your tactics and and be prepared to uh to fish a variety of ways up here i wouldn't i wouldn't get too dialed in on any one thing so we went up there with intentions of fishing teleco one time and the water was so high, we ended up wearing, one, it was so high, but two, it was cold. We ended up mm -hmm. wearing life jackets that my buddy had just stuck behind the seat of his oh, truck. Wow. Yeah, it was big. There were there yeah. were kayaks up there and all that. And we ended up camping right on the road with a couple of folks that were kayaking. We got, I mean, we, we ate dinner together. We watched them kayak. They watched us fish. But we ended up straying away from our original plan of, of fishing teleco and went up and fished the bald uh, mm -hmm. or i'm sorry we fished uh, we fished the north not the north bald. yeah we fished the north river uh just because the water was so high so be ready to to adapt if you have to i mean we, we couldn't find a place on teleco that we really thought was okay there's fish here and it's you know and it's safe Mm -hmm. uh, we were really we were staying right at that pull off right above i think baby falls is that what it is above ball ball river right falls? yep yep we were at that pull off right there like i said we just throw a tent down there and throw some rocks yeah. around in a circle and put some wood in it and you know that was our campsite so yeah don't be afraid to stray off from your plan so be prepared uh is what i would say be prepared to change a plan at any moment because you never know what's going to happen up there i mean heck it could rain for an hour and maybe two inches. Yeah. And with that too, I mean, if you plan a weekend up here and it just happens to fall on a weekend with a lot of rain, you know, don't be entirely discouraged. I mean, there are some weekends where it's going to be just ripping no matter where you go, just a torrent and you're not going to be able to fish anything up here. But, you know, if you get a couple inches of rain even and uh, that teleco is up and muddy and, and not really fishable or, you know, even safe, you know, every, every, Creek up here has its own personality. North River, especially, uh, is a low, lower gradient, and even at high water, you can do really well um, up there. It's usually the first to clear, and it's still weightable, and and fish can really turn on up there. So you know, just be prepared to to change your plans, like you said, Dave, and you know, explore a little bit. So I wouldn't miss an opportunity to to go up there if I could make it happen. I'm just, it's just my schedule is the problem. Uh, but I really want to go back up there. And, and like we were talking about before, I think it's going to be the next big thing as far as good places to stay. Like you were talking about, they got a bakery up there in Teleco Plains. Mm -hmm. They've got places to buy food, places to eat. One of my favorite restaurants yeah. used to be up there and I don't know, it's back open again. I'm not sure if it's the same place. It probably is, but uh, you know, I, I I remember being up there and going down to meet some, come off the mountain to meet somebody <laughs> mm -hmm, and everything yeah. was closed. Not even a gas station was open. I mean, there was well, nothing open. <laughs> it's uh, it's nine 30 here and I'm probably the only light on uh, downtown at all. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you are. Uh, aren't you? But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's kind of bittersweet. I love seeing um, the energy in town. I love, the community that's growing up here in Teleco and the fly fishing community that has a place to kind of center around the, the shop and have made a lot of great friends. And I see a lot of new faces and, you know, it's bittersweet because we want to make sure that what draws people up here continues to provide that and, and not have, I, I'd never want to see the day that someone goes up North river and can't find a place to park oh, because it's yeah. too crowded because North river is easy access with a road along it. And there's no doubt it gets more pressure now than it ever has. But, you know, we want to we want to um, 
we want to try to um, direct the growth in a way that is educational for folks that they want to have a successful trip, but they also um, learn how to, to properly handle fish, you know, proper etiquette and everything that goes with that. Uh, and, and just make sure that that, you know, if they're going to come up here, that they, they develop that appreciation and, and respect for the area and for the streams and keep them the way that they are as much as possible. So, you know, change is inevitable, but being kind of ground level as we are, you know, hopefully will help us kind of direct that change in a way that's best for the area. Yeah. Kind of you're at this point in your position, you're kind of the, the steward for the fly fishing community more than probably the, the bait guys and that sort of the, and the gear guys, but yeah. I we hope so. We hope we rub off on everybody a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, I can tell you care about the area and that's, that's number one. So that does rub off on people and people realize that and recognize it. So, well, you want to go ahead and close this thing out here? Sure. Uh, well, let's do it. Our guest is a professional guide who owns Teleco Outfitters in Teleco Plains, Tennessee. He fishes and guides the Teleco River and the tributaries. Cody, just to FYI, and I don't know if I, I, I told you this, but you came highly recommended as a guest uh, from a couple of different folks that have been on the podcast. So uh, that's great. I yeah. think you just proved their recommendation accurate, and I appreciate that. Thank you for taking time hope, out of your schedule. <laughs> I hope I lived up to their expectations. Yep. Uh, you did. I think, uh, like I said, we're looking for for useful information. Maybe not all your deepest secrets, uh, but you know, useful information is uh, is a good thing. Again, if you find value in the podcast, share this episode and the podcast with your friends. Drop by the Southeastern Fly Store. Uh, explore the merch that fly that fuels the Southeastern Fly Podcast. Remember, coaching session times are available. If you get a chance to go to Teleco, stop by Teleco Outfitters and and, and visit Cody uh, and his staff there. I I think you. I'm looking at a. I'm looking at the fly shop right now on the Zoom call, uh, and already I can see there's some rods in the back. There's a really nice small mouth back there. So, it, it seems like this is a fishy place to be. A fishy group of guys. <laughs> Again, Cody, really appreciate you taking the time out on this. I don't know if you can hear the wind here, but it's blowing. I swear it's going to blow the the, the shutters off this house. It's oh, crazy blowing here. But uh, anyway, uh, appreciate you stopping by, and you just listened to Cody Fisher on the Southeastern Fly Podcast. See you next time. Fine. Yeah, I'm about 10 minutes away, and I've been chugging on this energy drink for the last uh, <laughs> hour or so, so I'm, I'm going to have to run that off. Um, I hope I didn't get too in the weeds on the brook trout and all that. Oh, uh, no, I don't think you did. That's, that's something we didn't talk about on the phone, but, man, that is what is – I mean, I, this area – and, dude, I've, I've fished – we've talked. I've fished 
North Platte, the Bighorn, Yellowstone National Park. I've fished the Ozarks, the Driftless, Shenandoah. I fished a lot of places and there's just like it, Teleco. Uh, and, you know, I'll be honest, like when I first moved in, into this area and had the idea of opening the shop, like I, I didn't know what all Teleco provided. I knew it had a lot. And I thought, well, this is just the opportunity for me to do what I want, which is open the shop. But I didn't realize like how much this area actually provided. It, it's amazing. Like it's a, it's really amazing. And like, you know, if you're coming from out West, like I did, and if you, and I never, it's never a problem for me. Cause I don't, I mean, I'll crawl through the smallest creeks, even out West when you've got oh, creeks yeah. that are a hundred, hundred feet uh, wide, I'd still find the little willow line Creek and literally crawl on bow and arrow cast <laughs> and have a blast, you know, giggle like a little kid the whole way. Right. But so I never minded what, what we have here, but as long if you're into bigger fish and, and these big wild fish, if you just kind of, you know, set that aside for a little bit and, uh, and fish some of these small streams, like, I don't know how you could not enjoy it when you watch a, you know, even a six, eight inch rainbow come up and just slam a, 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 a size 12 parachute with all the aggressiveness of a friggin' Mako shark. Like, you know, how could you not enjoy that? So... the movie jeremiah johnson yes that's everybody's dream by the way cody i watched that i watched that probably i've probably seen that a hundred times like i my me and my cousins used to quote it like you know word for word and so my dream when i was maybe a teenager was to just i always want to do it never did but just go live live in the woods for like a year you know or or be as far away from society as possible 